you so much. It's truly an honor to be here today. The focus of my work really is around how machines can help us process massive amounts of data and try to understand the soul of global society. It's about looking across this rich tapestry of global information, telling the diverse stories of our shared planet, and transform it into visualizations of global society through the eyes of social media, of television, of books, of academic literature, even of Wikipedia. In turn, this led to that question of what if we could take all of the news coverage in a single day, scoop it all up, process it, and generate a visualization of global society, of all of the dreams, the fears, the narratives, the events, the thoughts, the beliefs of a single day of, global, of the global world. In other words, the global conversation. A vision which today now spans 400 languages and counting. Now, one of the most transformative aspects of the AI revolution is really how it's transformed our ability to look at the globalized world, to look at moving imagery from every portion of the world, across all the languages of the world. Now, the Internet Archive's TV News Archive spans 100 channels from 50 countries, uh, from five continents over portions of the last 20 years. This incredible archive of global human society. But historically, journalists and scholars couldn't use this archive because, you know, it's this massive collection of video. So if I want to know, for example, how is the world covering something like inflation or something like Ukraine, there was no way that a typical scholar or journalist could look through this enormous archive of material. Well, that's where AI has really transformed things. So with the invasion of Ukraine last year, the Internet Archive began monitoring uh, Russian, Belarusian, and Ukrainian television. And so the question was put to me, so we have, you know, we have scholars, we have journalists that want to use this material. How can they, you know, how can they make sense of this? Because most of them don't speak those languages. So we started off using traditional, so Google's traditional speech recognition and then Google Translate to create actual, within hours of broadcast, an actual English translation of each broadcast. So you could actually watch, as a journalist, you could watch that broadcast and get an English transcript right there as you're going. And again, it's not perfect. Machines are far from perfect. But they're good enough that you can get the general gist. I can understand what they're saying there. And that was, that was huge, that was transformative. But then something amazing happened. Large speech models. So whereas before we could you know, process dozens upon dozens of languages, suddenly it's hundreds upon hundreds of languages that we can analyze. And so this is actually a broadcast from uh, Chinese state television. One minute, English, Mandarin, Arabic, all in one minute. And that's, that's really incredible. So we, we didn't know that. So we basically said, transcribe this broadcast. It's all in Mandarin. And it saw this and transcribed all this perfectly. And that, to me, is a really, really fundamental aspect. Because you look across the world, there's a lot of multilingual and code-switching societies that are out there. And historically, when we had to use machines to look at that content, we couldn't do much there. Uh, but now, um, this is opening up a whole new area of research for us of multilingualism in news coverage, how the stories of the world are being told. But of course, what makes television so interesting is the visual dimensions of it. And so using AI to try to ask, like, what are the narratives? So, you know, again, television, it's, it's yes, it's the spoken word, but so much of it's the visual dimension of it. And so with Tucker Carlson, so we originally was asked, Tucker Carlson, how often does he appear on Russian television? So we used traditional face, you know, face scanning, tracked up how much airtime he appeared. And that's the timeline at the top. But then we asked, we said, well, what's the real question here? It's not how often Tucker Carlson's on television. It's how often, it's basically who's telling the story there on Russian television. So we took an episode of 60 Minutes, it's a major television show there, and we extracted out all the human faces, and we built a co-occurrence graph. Who appears alongside of whom on, on a given broadcast? And so we get a network diagram like this up there. But then we asked, what if we scale this up? So we took an entire year of that show, 50,000 minutes of airtime, a quarter of a million human faces, and built a co-occurrence graph of that. So at the center is Olga, she's the presenter. Her co-presenters, though, are in this outer ring, showing that they don't really play a huge role in that show. And if you drill into this network and you look all throughout it, what you eventually find is you can see all the different narratives and who tells each of those narratives there. And so again, starting with a very simple traditional tool, like facial scanning that's been used for a very long time, and asking, how can we reuse that in a really interesting way? 
And then, but, you know, and then we start to ask, well, so what does television news actually depict? Like, how does it visually tell the stories of the world? And so historically, computer vision tools, they were limited to about 30,000 objects and activities, which was enough that when COVID hit, we said, well, what's different about COVID television compared to pre-COVID television? The answer, bookcases. Everyone ran home and broadcast wherever they could find a bookcase, but not on every channel. Uh, so BBC News and MSNBC in America were everywhere. CNN and Fox News, not so much. So this is really fascinating to us. Um, now, again, 30,000 objectivities is not a lot, but it's enough to do key things. So we could track the density of military imagery on Russian television. We could see how it starts very high, goes down, 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 and then loops back up again. And this is really powerful. But why allow someone else to dictate what we can analyze? So along came multimodal embeddings. You could type in plain English the type of image you want, a description of the image, and it will return images. So you could say soldier in front of a Russian flag and actually get that. And this is incredibly powerful. But why stop there? Why have a human describe instead of having the machine do it? So we actually have um, a golden retriever detector. It scans uh, television news for golden retrievers. It's a cute little toy. Um, but so here's a sample golden retriever here. And we asked the machine to write a description of that golden retriever. And so everything you see here, it actually keeps going and going and going. This is all machine generated. Now, what's interesting, though, is this is the 30th try. The first 29 tries, it didn't work so well. And so this is one of the dangers of generative AI is what you typically see is the final result, the one that actually worked, not the, you know, 50 or 100 plus times it took to get to that result. But when it works, it works really well. But this is one image, a machine describing one image. What if we scale up to an entire day? So we asked the machine, summarize an entire day of Russian television news. And it, and it gave us a summary here, and it's a little bit hard to read, but basically it gave us a summary, minute by minute, of what it was seeing. But again, we ran it five times, actually ten times, ten different results. It looked like ten different days of coverage. And this is, again, the instability of generative AI, um, but it's still... There's a lot of potential here. There's incredible, incredible potential. But this is still a textual summary. So this is taking a day of Russian television and sharing a textual summary. But oftentimes what I want is a structured summary. So during the Turkish earthquake, we explored, could we have these machines read through all this news coverage and catalog in codified form what it was seeing? And this, was, this is a kind of interesting. You think about summarization as starting with you know, flowing text to flowing text. Now we want to structure it uh, because ultimately you don't usually want to, you don't want to take a day of television and condense that down to 50 pages of text. You want that table that helps you. But this is still factual information. Oftentimes what you want to do is to read between the lines. So we asked it, look across one day of global, of global news coverage and tell me what's the tone towards China on each day? Is it positive? Is it negative? How is China portrayed as strong or weak? And explain yourself. And this is really powerful that we have machines now that can begin reading through the lines just a little bit. But again, why have machines summarize the news? Well, typically because you want to do something with that. So we had a machine watch a day of Iranian state television. And we said, look for any mention of the nuclear accord. If it's pro, leave it. But if it's anti-nuclear accord, write a point-by-point -point rebuttal to that specific mention in English, in Persian, for news, for social media, etc. And this is what you get. It's pretty, it's pretty actually, it's pretty incredible for a machine and fully autonomous. So you could think of this as fully autonomous diplomacy. Now, is this incredibly powerful or incredibly scary? That's the million dollar question. But the fact is, we're actually here now. That's where we actually are now. And we even had to generate imagery. Now, this imagery here is a year old. Uh, you know, the tools have gotten far, far better. But still, we were able to actually do that. Now, what's interesting about this, by the way, is if you kind of look at the spectrum of generative AI right now, image generators are actually the most accurate right now, followed by code generators and then text generators. And you might say, well, text seems a lot easier and simpler. It's because of the type of questions. Oftentimes, textual involves reasoning and complex reasoning, which I'll come back to in a minute. But here's where things get really incredible. So this is one day of Iranian television. We every few seconds extracted a frame and then we clustered it all. Now at first glance you might say, well, it just looks like a mess of images. But that's what's so fascinating about this, is that you have domestic and foreign, tele foreign branches of their television there. And there's not a lot of divide between those. It's kind of a unified media space, which makes sense. And actually if you drill into this, you can see all the sub-stories that are there. But that's one day of one country. How about one day of three countries? 
China, Iran, and Russia. Now, in the image up there, it kind of looks like the bottom two are overlap, but you can see down here, it's just the angle. So they actually are totally separate. Now, this is really fascinating. It shows that we have parallel, each country we live in, it's a parallel media universe. But what's so interesting here is that if you actually drive in, they're telling the same stories, but they're telling them in such different ways that they almost seem to be different stories. But that's one day of three countries. How about one day of the entire planet? So this is the global conversation circa today. This is one day of global news coverage. Every little tendril in there is an arc of stories, allowing us to really kind of look into what is the structure of our stories? How, how, is our, you know, how is our global media, how is our global society work? But that's one day. How about three days of the entire planet? And this is where things get really interesting because we start diving into this and we start seeing these common patterns. We look across these three and they don't look wildly different. There's definitely differences, but not wild differences. And what that tells us is that, you know, contrary to this idea of every day being this wild cacophony of voices, there's actually a lot of commonality, a lot of momentum to our media, even across months. And there's a lot of structure. Certain countries, certain news outlets kind of dominate that discussion. So this is a really powerful way of kind of asking those questions of who's telling the global narrative. But now we're way up here. Let's dive all the way down to one corner, one day of COVID vaccine narratives, one tiny little corner of one of those maps you just saw. And we can see all these different stories and how they interconnect. We can actually see the falsehoods and how they blend together. And this is really interesting because you can see emergent falsehoods. And you can actually see them move through the trajectory, collide, and take pieces of them away with each other, just like uh, essentially colliding galaxies. But then we can dive even further because remember, stories are really just weaving together entities, people, places, things, events. So we can delve down and see what, what's actually driving each of these stories. But then we can go even further down and we can ask, uh, we can look at the global news tone over the past quarter century. So you can see in the early part, very stable, but then we can see something happens in the 90s and then everything collapses after that. So that's the rise of web news. So early on, news outlets didn't really compete with one another. But with the web, every news outlet in the world is competing with every other news outlet. So you start seeing these extreme headlines and negativity and all these things rise there. And this is really fascinating because, you know, the question is, is our world becoming more darker or is it our news media? That we can't answer. But what we can tell you is it's not social media that made the world a bad place is the rise of the web. And this is the fascinating question of just, you know, what, what the impacts of these technologies are. Now we can dive even further and we can look for the earliest glimmers of tomorrow's biggest stories. So actually um, at uh, 10 p.m. Eastern time, December 30th, 2019, we saw this enormous, this enormous surge of discussion uh, of a SARS-like viral pneumonia in China. And that was the first glimmers and that actually led the following day to a worldwide alert. Um, that, hey, there's this, this thing coming. And that's really powerful because you start with something like that. You, know, you think about, you start off with this, this, this enormous map of global society, and you can drill down, you can look at that, the, those giant network diagrams I showed you, you can actually sift out of those, these immense patterns of planet Earth. But I wanna end on a note of caution. So most of what you're seeing about generative AI today is the hype, the hyperbole, the trying it a hundred times and reporting the one time it worked, not the 99 times it didn't. So in our world, what we find, hallucination is a massive existential issue here. So you might have heard of hallucination in these. That's when they make things up. And you have a lot of companies out there say, oh, there's this one weird trick that'll get rid of hallucination. It's not possible. It's existential to how these models work. An example of this, the Chinese spy balloon. Um, so we had a broadcast, we asked it to summarize that. And that became a, hyper, a nuclear capable hypersonic missile aimed at the American homeland. My favorite was the American homeland lie in ruins and our submarines were going to sea uh, for their final strike. And you know, we can laugh about that, but that's a problem when you're trying to have a machine summarize uh, global media. A transcript. So uh, um, there's a difference today in speech recognition. Tools like Chirp, which we use, they try to transcribe what they see. But there's a lot of generative speech recognition tools that actually try to clean it up and make it a little bit more fluent. So one of them, NATO fully supports. So they quote the NATO Secretary General as saying, hey, we fully endorse Russia's invasion. That's a problem because we actually flagged that as a deep fake before we realized what happened. Um, plagiarization, you actually have to summarize a piece of text. It may be a great summary, but turns out it's actually copy and pasted from across the web. So actually, if you take human generated text uh, and you take machine generated text, you can actually easily tell them apart by looking at all, by basically dividing the chunks of text and searching the open web for those. Uh, machines are not nearly as creative as we'd like to think. 
Uh, and then uh, one final thing is bias. And this is a huge, huge issue. So we generate a set of synthetic uh, CEO summaries. And we just we generate a set of summaries. All we did was change the gender and the race of each and use a semantic search engine for that. White men, Hispanic men, black men. White men, Hispanic men, black women for searches like CEO or leadership. These are huge, huge issues we need to understand. Thank you so much. It's been a tremendous honor being here today.